Hi everyone, and welcome back to Part of Speech Tagging, part two. So in this section, we're going to cover a couple more ways to part of speech tag in R, while also looking at how to do this in Python using sort of very traditional package and a newer package. But first, the ripple route, ripple, rah, 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 the ripple down rules part of speech tagger. So this is a part of speech tagger that is based on a set of like set of rules, hence the name, that are sequential in order. And it has one of the largest language sets supported next to a package called UD pipe. So it's more inclusive of languages than some of the other packages that we've looked at. And it's based on the corporate universal dependencies, which is also what UD pipe is based on, hence the UD universal dependencies pipe. So both of these packages use the really great resources at the universal dependencies website to build uh, systems of NLP. So to do this, we load up the package. Okay. My biggest complaint about this package is that it requires Java. Our Java can be a big pain in the butt to set up and to get running properly. But if you can get that to work, this is a great package. You can look at what models are available. It is rather um, limited in complex part of speech tagging. So it will do universal part of speech tagging for all the languages you see below. However, it will only do like the full like kind of brown set, the more, the more um, involved tags for a couple languages. But that's okay, universal tagging is quite handy. It's better than nothing. And it will do morphological tagging in some languages as well. Okay. So it runs in the traditional Python style. What does that mean? Well, remember in Python, we build a model, we fit data to the model, or we add things to the model, and then we, we examine it. So the ripple down rules, I cannot say that, ripple down rules package allows us to first set my parameters by picking a a language and annotation type I'm interested in and building a blank model and then applying that to a sentence. So fitting that model to the sentence. The output is thankfully a data frame, unlike the rest of these, which have been kind of formatted strangely, that includes part of speech as a particular column. Oh, excuse me. So let's look at that. So we're gonna create a blank tagger that is a ripple down rules model where our language is English and the interesting thing that we want is the part of speech tags. All right, now it's gonna give me the full parts of speech tags and not the universal tag set, but I could switch it to the universal tag set. And so I would say, okay, ripple down rules, give me part of speech with my tagger I just built with all the defaults and on our long sentence. I remember the issue that we've been having with this sentence is the word fire. And unfortunately, this one still gets the word fire wrong. And so we see that the sentence, um, it still misses this, but otherwise it's pretty good. Now, the nice thing here is it's in long format, which means that each token is its own row in the data set, and it will run multiple documents and tag them as separate documents. So this will put this in a format that you can really use to analyze differences between sentences or documents or paragraphs, et cetera. However, it can get really long, really fast if you have a lot of text because every single token will get one row. So it's easy to have a million line data frame. Now, my favorite one is definitely UD pipe. I've mentioned it multiple times already. And um, it also has the, it uses a universal dependency. So it has the same sets of models. And so what you do is library UD pipe. You tell it what you wanna run on. So on our sentence with English as my main language, I could type the full name of the English model because there are several. And you can look at UDPipe's website to look at all the available models. There are a bunch. And then I printed out the first 10 rows and only printed out a couple of the columns. So UDPipe can be quite slow because it actually is similar to Spacey in the sense that it runs many different forms of NLP processes. So it also does dependency parsing, which is really cool. And so that can make it kind of slow. And there are ways to turn that on and off if you're interested. And in this particular case, I told it to just print out the information from part of speech tagging so we don't see everything. 
So it does give you way more than this um, set of columns I'm showing you here. I just wanted it all to fit on one screen. So it gives me the token, the lemma. So remember, limitization is where we take the word back to its root form. So UDPipe actually does limitization already for us, which is really nice. None of these words are changed, but other words might be. The UPAUSE or universal part of speech. Um, so does the 10 tag set. And then the features of that. So in this case, it says we is a plural noun. Um, and it's a pronoun type. It has a pronoun type. The, let's see here, the tense is present tense. Okay. The verb form is infinitive, right? So it tells you that there's a singular noun. And so there's a lot of interesting information about the type of tag that you've gotten. And I do want to know here that UDPipe gets fire correct. It's one of the first, it's the only one we've seen so far that has gotten fire correct in the sentence as a verb, which is really cool. All right, so on to Python. We've looked at several different R packages, pros and cons of each one. I would highly suggest UDPipe as the option to use because it does not require the use of Java. It puts the output into a data frame, which is easy to manipulate. And it, I so far have seen that it gives me better results. If I were to do this in Python, I would probably pick Spacey. But NLTK includes multiple part of speech tagging options that are very good. And Spacey is technically the state of the art okay, um, when it comes to free Python packages. There is a paid version of, of Spacey, but they call it, I think, Prodigy, um, which is a whole AI system. But we'll be using the like package part itself. Unfortunately, the setup for a lot of Python packages can be very strenuous when you're dealing with Java. Neither of those require Java, but there are other Python options, um, uh, particularly like there's a Stanford one that requires you to like really set up Java and it's, it's even worse than the R setup. But let's start with NLTK because it is the classic, the tried and true and works really well. And the basic POS underscore tag function is pretty effective. And so we import an LTK, do, um, do word tokenize on our sentence. So this does require that they already be tokens, tokenized. So word tokenize on our sentence. And then do POS tag on our tokens. Two things to note here. What does it return? It returns us a list, so square brackets list, of tuples, okay? These tuples are pairs with the word first and the part of speech second. It does automatically also give us the more complex part of speech tagging versus UDPipe, which gives us the universal tag set, sorry. So good and bad. A list in tuples can be converted easily into a pandas data frame by telling it these are the columns, right? So each, two, each pair is a part of the column set. A uh, list of tuples is also easy to iterate over, meaning we could run some other counting functions or um, making plots, right? So if I wanted to know what proportion of these were nouns, I could use the fact that they're all in tuple number two to count them up. But it does mean that the data, it's not in the data frame automatically. Right. Now, it does not get fire correct. So a word about tuples. We've previously compared Python lists to R vectors, but really Python lists are more flexible than R vectors. They're like R lists. So they can be a list of any type of object, um, including a list of lists, a list of tuples, a list of data, data frames, if you wanted, a list of dictionaries was the word I was looking for. Okay. So I can tell that it's a list by looking at the square brackets in the output. And I can change items in a list by using slicing. I can reorder the list. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm out of nowhere. One moment. I can reorder things in the list. I can overwrite things in the list. I can add things to it, right? However, tuples are what's considered an ordered collection. It can be any number of objects. I know tuple sounds a lot like two in English, but it's more than can be three objects. We've already seen three objects. And tuples are immutable, meaning you cannot change them. 
No, I can't overwrite list spot number one, which happens to be a tuple, but I cannot overwrite list spot number one, tuple slot number two. So what that means is I could say, well, this is totally wrong, erase it, start over. But I can't say this part fire here is wrong. I would have to erase the whole tuple and write in a whole brand new tuple. Okay. And I could tell it's a tuple by looking for the regular parentheses. And much of the output from NLTK is formatted in the um, structure of lists of tuples. Okay. Many of the newer packages use their own embedded objects. But the nice thing about lists of tuples is that these are based Python objects that are very easy to manipulate. We could loop through them, or we could convert them to other types of objects, like a pandas data frame. Now, spacey. I really like Spacey. I don't love the newest Spacey. I'm dating myself. This is November 2021. I don't love the newest Spacey. Maybe next year my answer will be different. I'll re-record this, but we're going to keep using Spacey too because I understand what the heck is going on. And the newest version of Spacey I have not totally figured out. So many of the functions that I'm going to show you here will still work pretty well um, for part of speech tagging. But as you get into parsing and some other functions, they're pretty different. So just a warning, we're using Spacey 2.2.3. And once you upgrade past that, some of this code may not work. Okay. So previously in the lecture, I imported Spacey and loaded that English language module as NLP as our model to run function, run things through. Uh, and I printed these out in a different way before. I converted them into a pandas data frame. That's probably more efficient, but here's another way to print stuff out. Okay. And so I tagged my sentence by running NLP on my sentence. And then I ran a, a, a for loop, not all to embed it together, to separated this out into two lines. So for each word in my tagged sentence, because it's already tokenized for me, print out the original word, the word part of speech and the word tag. Okay. And the difference here is I think word part of speech is more the universal tag says, it's kind of close, it's less tags and the word tag has more complex tags. Okay. So we cannot nor would we fire professor person, it also misses fire. And so in summary, the only P package that gets fire corrects in this instance, which admittedly is odd, is UDPipe. Every other package has missed it. <clears throat> but otherwise, it's really easy to, to work with the output from Spacey here. Could put this in a pandas data frame and then calculate statistics on it. Okay. And if you need the like, how do I put it in a pandas data frame? That's earlier in the slides at the very beginning of last week's lecture. So what if you wanted to train your own? This is where Spacey becomes extraordinarily complex, <laughs> unfortunately. And we'll look at how we train some of our own taggers for dependency parsing and NER named entity recognition with the caveat that the newer forms of Spacey make this even more difficult. <laughs> Personally, I just have, they're just, it's a lot of formatting. I will warn you in advance. The, the gold standard data set format is this, uh, basically JSON, but can be hard to get it into the right shape. So here, instead of trying to look at training in Spacey for part of speech tagging, because it's already pretty, pretty good, I want to show you the classics and allow you to think about how you could just apply normal machine learning rules to this, or you could not even go that complex. So what we're going to do is start with the like simplest thing one can do and work our way up to a trained tagger and then show like you could use um, regular machine learning or even deep learning to build these kinds of models. I think with logistic regression, you can get the answer pretty damn close. So I'm not sure that I think deep learning models add a whole lot if you need the speed to be fast because those things do take a long time to run in that that added complexity does not get you running much better. Now these pre-built trained neural net models like Spacey do run fairly quickly. So, you know, pros and cons, look at what you were trying to do and then um, figure out what provides you the best accuracy speed trade-off. 
but we'll start simple. And we're going to use the classics in NLTK because this great package still works pretty well. We're going to look at the default tagger, the regular expression tagger, a lookup tagger, a unigram tagger, and then a combination system, which is the best system. So let's look at the default tagger. What is a default tagger? Well, if we don't know, the best guess is a noun. The most common type of part of speech is a noun, meaning the most words are literally tagged as nouns. The most common words that we'll actually see, however, are determinants, prepositions. So there's a distinction here between the, the individual unique tokens. If I look at all the tokens, the most likely thing you're going to run into is a noun. If I look at like the sentences themselves, so the most likely tags you're going to see are the filler words because we need those filler words to hold the sentence together. But those are repetitive, right? V, an, and a are very common words and they repeat. So there are more nouns in the world, but when we speak and talk, there are more prepositions. Now we could start by going, you know what? If you don't know a noun is the best guess, and this obviously won't be very good because there are many parts of speech, but it's not a bad place to start. For this example, we're going to use the brown corpus and its tag set. Its tag set has 54 or 57, somewhere in there, different tags, which means that chance, just guessing, is about a one in 50th chance or 2%, I think. So anything we do above that is better than chance. Now, obviously, for part of speech tagging, we'd love to get into the 90s percentages because very good part of speech taggers are well over 90%, usually in the 95% range. So let's see how we can do with some simple tagging. And generally this is the fallback rule. So using a default tagger is often the like, nothing else works, it's a noun. Just guess, we don't actually know. Okay. So from NLTK corpus, I'm gonna import the brown corpus. I am going to build a blank model. And my blank model, much like a machine learning where you build a blank logistic regression model or build a blank naive base, I'm gonna build a blank model and I'm gonna give it the rules or the features. Those rules or features in this case is everything is a noun. So my blank default option is noun. Okay. So in theory, this isn't machine learning because it's not learning anything, but it's very similar to the setup in a regular machine learning kind of workflow because we build a blank model and we build we tell it what what the rules are right? in you know logistic regression model we'd build a blank logistic regression and fit some data to it here we just are saying no need for the data everything's a noun all right in this cable uh, example i'm just going to pick the news category from brown in theory, you'd want to show it everything that as much data as you possibly could, because then your tagger will be better. But this is just a working example for class. So we're going to grab all the words from the news category in brown. And I'm going to say, OK, tag it up. So apply my default tagger by using dot tag on my news category. And not too surprisingly, it tagged everything as a noun because that's what we told it to do. So how good is that? Well, to actually assess the accuracy of my model, because of the way NLTK is set up, I need tagged sentences instead of just tagged tokens. So, okay, fine. Grab all of the browned tagged sentences because this is a corpus set that has the answer. So remember in a uh, supervised machine learning, you have to have the answer. So you have a data set or training corpus that has both of the, the data to train on and the answer. So you can check accuracy. And then we have that in this scenario. And the Brown corpus for a long time was one of the best data sets for this because it was large and it had the answer. Obviously now there are, are really great data sets, um, especially on the universal dependencies website. So I'm going to grab all my tag sentences and I'm going to use dot evaluate on the whole set, which is another issue. We'll come back to that in a minute. So if I evaluate the entire set of my tagged sentences, I get 13% correct. 
And that's the whole data set. So 13%. That's better than chance, because remember, chance is about one in, uh, one in 50, so 2%. So 13% is better than that, but we could easily do better. So let's look. So let's move on and try regular expression tagging. This is what people did for a long time, um, where we're matching common um, word endings, not line endings, word endings and other known patterns. This is really good if a language is exceedingly regular. English, not so regular. So it'll only get us a little bit extra. But in this example, what we're gonna do is create these patterns. Now these patterns are analyzed in order. And so if it matches the first pattern, that's what it gets assigned as and it moves on. The little R right here before our quotes implies that it's a regular expression. Okay. So any words, dot star, remember here, any, any letters before it and an ing makes it a gerund verb. Okay, so present participle. Any letters before it and an ed makes it a past tense verb which is not so good because there are a lot of words that end in ed that are not um, verbs. So this is a hack, right? But we'll see how good it does to us. Any words that end in es is third person singular present. I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks. So English has a weird third person singular present where it adds an s, but here we're grabbing every es because every regular S is a plural noun. So you're gonna get some of those wrong. Anything that ends in O-U-L-D is a modal. That's actually pretty close, would, could, should. <laughs> so there aren't too many more. Um, anything that ends in an apostrophe S is a possessive noun. Anything that ends in just a regular S is a plural noun. Any number is what's considered a cardinal number. We'll get most of those right. Everything else, don't know, make it a noun. Okay. So these are, this is our model here of patterns that we could expect. And there are a lot of good things about this. There's also a lot of the fact or the problem that English has so many exceptions that it's, I don't know if it's useful to know the rules. And again, these are matched in order. So if ing is present, it gets marked and moved on. Now line endings here would actually get tagged under s because it ends in an s. So let's try it. We'll build our blank tagger and tell it the rules here. So nltk.regex tagger on our patterns. A regular expression tagger is really useful for weird instances. So you can't train it because you don't have a training data set and got to write the patterns. So things like chat logs would be very useful for this sort of thing. If you were trying to sort out certain emoticons, for example. Now I am tagging my tokens. Tokens, remember here are, is our news category of words. And I just picked a random slice to print out. Thank you see, you know, we're missing a lot of our prepositions. So we've only shown it, what, four or five tags? Bop, 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 bop. So remember there are 54, 57 tags. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've only added eight of them. So we're not even capturing all the other tags like who, what, where words. And so not too surprisingly, it um, mostly gives us nouns, but we bump up from 13% all the way up to 20% just by writing a couple of rules. So there is some regularity to English. Now, what makes the most sense to me, and we'll end this um, train of thought on, <clears throat> is to, to potentially use the data you have to build a model, right? Which is how most machine learning works, right? And so a lot of high frequency words that are really driving our levels of accuracy, the and a of, into, upon, right, between, are not nouns. There's something else. So let's just pretend for a minute that I don't have the time and energy and I just want the top 100 words. 
And this is just a proof of concept that the top 100 words can get us somewhere quickly. In reality, if I were using this lookup system, I would use all of the words. But we're just going to show you like the power of thinking about frequency. And so we can use, let's say, the top 100 words with a lookup tagger. A lookup tagger is simply a set of rules. It's a dictionary of key value pairs, effectively, of the is a article, of is a preposition. Uh, Fulton County Grand Jury <laughs> is a proper noun. And this is really useful if there was a one-to-one -one match between the part of speech and the token itself. However, I have already told you about polysemy, where there is not a one-to-one -one match between the word and it's between a token and it's part of speech. Many, many, many English words have multiple meanings. And sometimes those meanings cross the boundary between noun and verb, for example, or a noun and adjective, or a verb and adverb. So mm, mm, this is gonna get us places, but maybe not be a very flexible system because it would only ever assign fire as a noun because that is the most probabilistic option. But if you don't know the answer, remember the answer is frequency. So what we'll do is create a frequency distribution. That's like a fancy phrase for a table of the parts of speech by the tokens and just to count. So this is a conditional frequency distribution where I have the part of speech here and the tokens this way. And it actually tells me that there's 218 parts of speech. So I was wrong. I thought the brown, for some reason, I thought the brown corpus only had like 57 tags, but you'll see that sometimes the tags are a little strange. So let's see here. V is tagged most of the time as AT for article. These other ones are still articles. They're just different forms of articles. Fulton is mostly ca ca categorized as a proper noun for NP. And I, these are very strange. I think they might be adjectives in this sense, county, uh, Fulton County Grand Jury. So it's modifying the next word. Either way, this table tells me which piece is the um, most frequent. So we could do a sum and just find the most frequent words. It also tells me which combinations are the most frequent. So for each column or each word, let's pick the most likely tag, which it would be the one with the highest frequency. So to do that in NLTK, now in R, this is just table. But in LTK, it's called frequency distribution. We just put in all of our words. Okay. Now, this is a singular frequency distribution of the words from the news category. I just grab the top 100. Okay. Now, again, I will reiterate, if I was doing this for real, I would use all of the data. This is a class example where I just pulled the top 100 words to show you how useful frequency is. So with the top 100 words, how much better can I do? Then imagine how much better I would do if I used all of them. On those top, on those words, I grabbed, uh, I did a conditional frequency distribution, which is using table twice in R basically, on my category. And I'm allowed to do that because the category includes those tuple pairs, right, of, or not the category here, the, the news tagged words include those tuple pairs of the word and its part of speech. And then I just told it to print out so you could look at it. Now pick, this is, this looks squirrely, but it's, it's just a loop. Pick the most likely, the most probable or the highest frequency of the tag for each word. And this is like which max, if you're familiar with that function in R. So for each one, give me the word and its maximum probability tag for each word in our frequent words. Okay. Now, why this empty tuple here? I don't actually need the second piece. I just need um, 
the the to loop over the words so i don't need to loop over both so you just leave it empty like it's shown here so for each word in my 100 most frequent words i'm going to get back the word and then it's tag it's max tag okay and then what i do is you, there's not a lookup tagger in an ltk instead what we do is use the unigram tagger which we're about to go over. And from that unigram tagger, we say that the, the model is our tags. So here are the answers. Okay. So for our baseline tagger here, what I'm doing is building a model on these tags. Like here are all of the answers. There are gonna be other words, but here are the answers we know. And for those other words that you don't know, it's a noun. Okay, so we're building on our previous default model. So this is actually a combination tagger. And I'm going to say, if I guess, I mean, you can see the answer at the bottom here, but if I guess from the 100 most frequent words and then guess everything else is a noun, how much better did I do than 13% where I made everything a noun? It's 60%. So as you can see, <laughs> the 100 most frequent words are doing most of the work here in, the in, in English. And that's because they're frequent. So when I said, if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency, I was not kidding. For part of speech tagging, the driving force is probabilistic frequency. Okay? And the words that you miss are ones that are just infrequent and unprobable, like fire being a verb. Okay. Well, how much better can I get if I just use the data as is? Let's see. This is the unigram tagger. And so this, the previous slide shows you just kind of how the unigram tagger works and kind of a proof of concept that uh, a small focus on frequency can get us very far. This time, what I'm going to do is let the unigram tagger do all the work. So for each word, now all of them, I'm going to pick the most common part of speech for that word. Okay. And so, for example, the word frequent, as in frequency, is assigned to be an adjective because frequent is most likely to be an adjective, although it can be a noun. Okay. This works much like the um, lookup tagger, but it, this is a training system. So it will train based on the data that you input into it. And training occurs where we look at each part of speech and we store the most likely one based on the um, available data. So the, the true unigram tagging is much easier. You just do dot unigram tagger. Here's my model. Here's the data, you figure it out. And so it picks in the background which ones are the most likely. It's called a unigram tagger because it uses each token one at a time. It does not consider pairs of tokens. Uh, it would be a bigram tagger. And so unigram tagger is the simplest example of what's called ngram tagging, where we are examining one word at a time, uni, Gram, one word at a time. Bigram tagging looks at two words at a time. Trigram tagging, blah, 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 three words at a time. And the biggest issue is that the more words you look at at once, the more context you get, which means you get better tagging. However, the more words that you string together, the less likely that combination is to have occurred because of creativity in language. And so you make the data more sparse. Sparse data is hard to predict from. So unigram tagging works really well. Again, you can see the answer at the bottom here um, because it provides a lot of information. The more complex tagging is more accurate, but you have to have very large data sets for it to be useful for you. And so um, I'm kind of cheating because I am tagging and then evaluating on the same data set. We're not getting into true machine learning here, but really you'd want to, to uh, train on a subset of the data and then evaluate on a different subset of the data. If you do that, which we'll do in our assignment together, uh, you'll see that it hovers around 90%. And that's pretty good. So these complex neural net systems get up to 95% accurate but by simply looking at each word and it's most likely part of speech, I can get close to 90% correct, which is pretty darn good.
So if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. The frequency predicts the most likely tag. And while these more complex systems are really great, again, we have to consider speed accuracy trade-off. So if your goal is speed, use simple tagging like this, maybe not in LTK, but a simple tag like this would be easy, easy to implement. If your goal is accuracy, maybe the more complex tagging through Spacey would be the ticket. Now, this is the first tagger that we've trained. Okay? Um, I still would not make this com super comparable to machine learning in the sense that um, we don't have any sort of algorithm here. It's just the algorithm is simply pick the most likely combination, right? We're not using naive Bayes or logistic regression or anything fancy here. It's just easy frequency <laughs> counts. But do I need that? I mean, I've got a 90% correct almost, right? Yeah. Every other tagger is simple, here's the rules go kind of system. Here's the regular expressions. Here's the 100 most common nouns, that kind of thing. Um, we shouldn't test and train on the same data. That is technically cheating because of course it will get most of the data right that's already seen before. And so often people do a 90-10 or 80-20 split on the data of testing and training. And I could do that. So let's try that. I'm gonna do 90-10 here. So I figure out how long the brown corpus is. So length here times 90%. And make that an integer. Round it. Can't break in the middle of a sentence. So my training sentences are the brown tag sentences from the first one up to, but not including the size from this first line. My test sentences are the brown sentences up to starting at that size to the end. Yes, I can learn has a test train split function that will also do this. But here's another way to do it. And now let's train on our training sentences only. So nltk.unigram tagger on our train sentences. Now let's evaluate on our test sentences and you can still see it's pretty high, it's 88%. If we shuffled the data and ran this again, we would get a different number. And so we could do this several times to get like sort of an overall general accuracy. This cross we can also do cross fold validation. It hovers between this and 92%. So it's like on average about 90% accurate. Just by looking at the most probable combinations, which is pretty darn cool. In languages that are more regularized, right? It, this gets better. English is very irregular language. <laughs> Um, however, all languages suffer from the problem, problem of polysemy, where words have multiple meanings and they can change class categories. So words that have multiple meanings that are in the same category, like they're just a bunch of different forms of the verb, you know, conjugation is what it is in a universal part of speech system where we're tagging everything as, that's a verb as a verb and not caring about tense, who cares? But when words we can become adjectives or adverbs or something else, and that's when it's difficult. For example, the word that can be nearly every part of speech. And that's a problem. It's the workhorse in the English language. It's a very common word as well. And the fact, the fact that it can be all these different parts of speech make it hard to predict. And one way to address the sort of accuracy and coverage trade-off. Now I haven't said the word coverage yet. Coverage is the idea that you want to get um, the most examples shown to your tagger. Uh, and a unigram tagger, that's not too hard, but as you start to add, like let's say a bigram tagger, that becomes more difficult because the examples become more specific. So to get greater coverage, all these different types of things that it can see, um, one thing you can do is build what are called back off or combination taggers. So show it the most specific things that it can come up with. And then for everything that doesn't fit into that, use the less specific things it can come up with and everything it doesn't fit into that, use a default. So we're backing off from most specific to least specific and hoping we catch them right in the middle. This is what most systems do, okay, that aren't neural net systems. 
And I think probably neural net systems are doing something like this under the hood. So we're going to combine the bigram tagger, which we didn't run all by itself, a unigram tagger and a default tagger. Bigram tagger looks at pairs of words. So if these pairs of words have occurred together, give both of them that tag. Unigram tagger looks at one word at a time. And then we have our default tagger. So start with our default tagger, then train on our unigram tagger with the back off as our default tagger. Then also allow for bigram tagging with the back off being the unigram tagger. So if the bigram tagger fails, it'll go to the unigram tagger. If that fails, it'll go to a default. And let's do T2 here, meaning test them in order on our test sentences, and we jump up to 91%. So that bigram tagger only added another 3%. And this is the idea of coverage. Because bigram tagging involves such specific combinations, if those combinations don't repeat in the test data, then the model doesn't know what to do. And so coverage here, this allows us to get extra specificity, but because of the sparsity of the data, meaning we don't have like tons of examples of each one, it is only adding a little bit extra bonus in the accuracy. Some people would argue 3% is worth the trouble. I would say that these models are fairly simple. So um, when it comes to computing speed, sure, it's worth the trouble. But then let's say you want to try to use a really complex deep learning model, computing speed may be the problem. Now, Spacey provides ways that you can do training, and it also provides pre-built models. We've mostly been using the pre-built English model that does part of speech tagging. You can train your own. That's especially useful if you have data sets that are different than just regular old talk, like Twitter is, as, you know, like half regular old talk and half internet speech if using chat logs or anything like that. Those would be very good for parts of speech taggers like, like those systems. Um, generally, I would say that Spacey's underlying is a neural net system. That's what they say it is anyway. Uh, they don't really tell you exactly how they do it, but you can do it. And um, you can learn more about using their tagging and their parsing. I would say the frustrating part was that they upgraded this system in the last year and um, made it incredibly complex personally. And they have a whole thing here that tells you about how to does it. The prodigy here is their paid system. And um, it, they will walk you through examples. When Spacey 3.0 first came out, none of their examples worked. And so I've stuck with teaching Spacey 2 because it's very stable. It has a lot of stack overflow, answer question and answers, and it runs. So I'm hoping in the next year or so that they will have a whole lot more. You can see that Space is already upgraded to 3.2 and we'll be able to, to use their newer systems um, to, to show you how to do some of this stuff. But I know I can get Spacey 2.2.3 to work. So we're going to stick with that for the rest of the semester and do a little bit of Spacey training. And I think you'll see what I mean um, in the dependency parsing and the named entity recognition sections about how you would spend more time structuring the data than you would training the data. So having a really good training data set is key and having it in the right format is the not so fun part. Now let's talk about a summary of everything together. In this section, last week and this week, we covered part of speech tagging by thinking about the structure of language as our main guide. Okay. We showed you how to tag words in R, and I really want to promote the beauty <laughs> pipe because it's so, so awesome, and Python using NLTK and Spacey. Then I showed you how to do some like classic training for, for Python and um, in NLTK. And we talked briefly here about how you could look at Spacey's help guides to program in their system. Uh, it's not like you can't do training in R. Sim surely you can because you can do machine learning in R. Um, but the, the goal here is to show you kind of like how simple it could be and how good simple systems are that run. So we used NLTK. 
what we're going to do is take this skill set that you've learned and ask more interesting questions like, can we now start to tag entities and can we do parsing? Parsing is the main component to writing any type of chat box. Um, so can I learn how to even break sentences down? Entity recognition is really important for understanding the links between things. So what we're going to do in the next couple sections is look at those two um, types of NLP tasks.